The other day I was thinking about remaking one of the video games that I used to play as a child. Using today's technologies that should be relatively easy. Now I decided to use WebGL as a technology for making this game and when you're making something that's running in a browser the mouse and the keyboard come across as obvious ways of controlling the character or the gameplay but in modern browsers you can also use a game controller. So in this video I'm going to take a look at uh, the gamepad API and just show a quick demonstration program uh, that you can that you can also use to see whether or not your system supports the gamepad API and to take a look at some information that's coming back from your gamepad to the system. So I'll be using Visual Studio Code for my uh, IDE for this and I've already started a project here. Uh, the main file in which I'll be working is going to be main.type main.ts and this is a TypeScript file. Uh, other than that there is like some CSS that's being used. Uh, my HTML is, is pretty simple. The only thing I'm doing within here is uh, I've created a few repeated structures uh, where I'm going to be showing uh, information that's coming back from the controller, both the axes and the buttons. And we'll talk about the, what those mean in a moment. But with respect to TypeScript, if you've never seen it before, just think of it as think of it as JavaScript with type information added, because really that's what it is. Anytime I make a change within this, there's a compiler running in the background, and it will produce the uh, same code within JavaScript. And just to show you that it's really working, I'll just add a new variable here, varx, make it of type number, and set it to a value of 50. If I save this, my main.js has already uh, been compiled, and so it shows that update. Of course, I don't want to actually have this in here, so if I delete this, save. If I look at the source code again, you can see that it's gone. Now, I already have an instance of IAS running. Uh, it doesn't matter what web server you're using, really, but I just prefer to use IAS. So it's running and it's loading this page. So if I go within here, uh, let me make sure it's refreshed. Yeah, so I can see the uh, most up-to-date version of the code. So let's start actually looking at the code. What I have here already, it only detects whether or not there is a uh, game controller um, detected. Now, one thing about how the game controller API works is even if your controller is con connected, even if it's turned on, the browser will not let your code see it until both uh, this window has focus and the user has clicked on a button on the controller. So my controller is turned on right now. I have focus, but I haven't pressed any buttons on the controller. Uh, let's go ahead and change that. I'm going to press one of the buttons now. And as soon as I do that, you can see that uh, this printed some event information and we can see from the ID of the controller it's a Bluetooth wireless controller. Now I also have an Xbox controller here. I'm going to go ahead and that's so the Xbox controller. I'm turning it on right now and now it shows it's connected. And if you're wondering how to tell one controller from another, one of the there's uh, several fields you look at, but the main one that you want to look at is inside the gamepad uh, element of the event that comes back, Take a look at index. Uh, in this case, uh, when the controller has an index of zero, that is, which controller is this? This is the Xbox controller. Let's take a look at this other controller. This is the Bluetooth 8-bit uh, controller. It has an index of one. Uh, even though the order that I turned these, I happened to turn these on was actually a reverse of this. So one thing to take note of is you could end up with only one controller connected to a system and that one controller might not have the lowest possible index. Now let's go back to the editor. We're going to make some updates to this code. Now, as you actually before that, let's take another look at this structure that comes back. So the gamepad uh, element is what we're interested in. Within the gamepad, the two fields that are going to be of main interest are the axis field and the buttons field. The axis field, it's just looking at each axis and giving you back the value for it. Uh, now, each one of the control sticks that is on the Xbox controller has two axes, an X axis and a Y axis. And you might have controllers that have other axes. They're not always going to come in pairs. There are some controllers where it might have triggers or rotational wheels that count as a single axis by itself. But these are always going to be analog values. They're going to be between the value of 0 and 1. Uh, in theory, whenever someone is not touching the control pad, it should be at a value of zero, but these tend to float a little bit. So in reality, if you see that, that the value is near zero, you should probably treat it as zero. Uh, 
Now the buttons can the buttons array. This has a list of the buttons and what their uh, respective values are. And at first you might think you might or you might expect that this would be boolean values, but it's not. There are boolean values within it. But let's just take a look at one of the buttons. One button has three fields within it. It has press, touch, and value. Now press does exactly what you think. If the person is pressing a button, then that's going to be true. If they're not pressing a button, it's going to be false. Touched. Some controllers can detect whenever someone just has your finger on a button. Not necessarily that it's pressed, but that it's just on there. And for controllers that can detect that, you'll see this field toggle as soon as they put their finger on it. Now, if a person is on a controller that doesn't support touched, you'll still see this value change. Whenever a button is pressed, then it's also assumed that it is touched. So you see touch update accordingly. Uh, the last value within here, value, uh, it's another value that can vary between zero and one. And for pressure sensitive buttons, it could be anywhere that's between zero and one. If it's, uh, if it's a purely digital button that does not detect pressure, it will only have the values zero or one. But for pressure sensitive buttons, if someone presses a button halfway down, you could get a value of 0 0.5 within here. And so you can read whichever one of these fields is most appropriate for whatever logic that you're developing. Now let's go back and start doing some edits to the code. Okay, and we're just gonna speed through writing this code because um, I don't think you'll get anything out of seeing me write it. So I'll just explain the completed code. Here we have the completed code. Now I've collapsed all of the functions and we can talk through them as we expand them one at a time. Uh, my start function looks a bit different now. I have, in, I have an interval within here, and if you were using this within a real game, this would be within whatever your game loop is. I don't have a game loop, so I've set an interval timer so that this will be called periodically. And I've put a delay in the interval of 100 milliseconds, so this is going to be called 10 times a second. Uh, what we do within here is I call the get game pads function, and this will return a state of all the game, cat, game pads that are connected to the system. So they come back in what looks like an array, but one thing to be aware of is you could end up with gaps within that, ar within that array. There are some elements within it that could end up being null. So you could have, say, gamepad state at the index 0, then you could have null at index 1, and then another gamepad state at index 2. So just be aware that even though this has a length property, that doesn't tell you how many actual items are populated within an array. But all I'm doing is I'm getting this state, and for the state of each controller, uh, I'm just updating it on the screen, and I'm doing that within this function update controller. So let's take a look at what that looks like. I'm going to expand this function. Now, flipping back and forth between the HTML, within the HTML, uh, I did have, we're going to consider this the root element that we're going to look at for now. So I have this one element called controller list, and within it, there were four uh, div tags that are of class uh, gamepad. So within a JavaScript, I'm getting a reference to whichever element had the controller list on it. Uh, I'm taking the index I'm supposed to be updating to know which child to get, and then I'm updating the axes and I'm updating the buttons on that. And that's all that update controller does. So the real work is being done within update axes and update buttons. Uh, let's take a look at update axes. There's a couple of things that I'm doing within here. Uh, the first thing I do is um, if a null element gets passed to this, it's just going to make the display uh, element that is modifying null. So if there's no controller attached, you're not going to see any state. Now, something else that I did is I didn't actually declare all of the HTML that I needed. Some of it is being created dynamically. Uh, so for each axis that I find, I'm going to create an element that is going to be populated later. Now part of the reason that I did this is I don't know how many axes that there are going to be in a game controller that comes back. That's something that I don't know until runtime, so I create all, all of these dynamically. Uh, but it's pretty simple. It's just a div tag, and within that div I have two others where the first one is a label and the second one has an integer value within it. And that's all that that does. So provided that the element exists, I either get, uh, if the element already exists, I get a reference to it. If it does not already exist, then I create it and hold on to a reference to it. 
And so uh, here I'm repeating the reference again and I'm just showing a uh, the value up to three decimal points uh, for the axis. So that's all that this does. Now update buttons is very similar. Same thing, if it gets an old element, it'll make sure that whatever it's displaying is, uh, is hidden. Um, and then also within here, I create some nested div tags. I actually used an inner for loop within here. Uh, I didn't really do too much to different, differentiate one tag from another, uh, but let's go ahead and collapse this. So once I have my div tags created, I just go ahead and populate each one with whether or not the button's pressed, whether or not it's touch, and the value. Uh, something else to notice, I'm using div, tab, div tags, but everything was kind of laid out like a table. The reason that was so is because I'm using CSS grid uh, in my CSS to give everything a table layout. Now there's a couple of other functions in here that uh, I have been playing with. They're not really doing anything. I could actually delete those at this point. So yes, I'm gonna go ahead and delete these, but you pretty much see the basis of how this whole thing works. Okay, here we are back within the interface. So let's take a look at how this works. Uh, you can see I've made some updates to it. So now that you can see which controller is which, this is showing up within the uh, UI so I can tell them apart. And I'm going to start off with the 8 bit controller. Now using the directional pad that's on it, and I should probably be recording this on another camera so that you can see what's going on here at the same time. Let's do that. So recording from both devices at the same time. On the 8-bit though controller, I'm gonna start playing with the directional pad here. So as I press on an axis, okay, you can see the first axis changing. So when I press left, it goes negative one. If I press right, it goes to one. Same thing with up and down. You can see the axis number two is changing. Now there's no other, there's no other axes that are on this controller yet. Uh, the data structure that comes back is showing nine axes. And like I said before, this can happen. You can end up with more axes than you actually have. Now if I start pressing the buttons, let's start off with the A, B, X, Y buttons. So A, B, X, and Y. And then we have our start and select buttons on here, which you can see are two other indices. And I have a couple buttons on the top for the left paddle and the right paddle. And that's all the buttons that uh, are on here. But once again, you can see that there's more buttons that show up on the UI than there are physical buttons that are on the controller. Let's go to the Xbox and just see how it looks. Now in here, we have four axes. So this is a little bit more predictable in how it works. The first axis, and it's analog, so as I press the stick uh, more and more, you can actually see it change. So left, right, Go completely up, completely down, and I can do the same with the other axis. And that's all the axes that these have. So one thing, one thing that that means is that this directional pad that's on the uh, Xbox controller, this actually shows up as buttons. So if I start pressing the directional pad now, you can see where some of the uh, button element are getting triggered. Now remember on the Xbox. Three, on the Xbox One and Xbox 360 controllers, the directional pads do also have buttons under them. So as I press down on uh, the directional pad, you can see where that gets uh, triggered. And the same thing on the other pad. Now as far as buttons go, we do have an analog button on here. Uh, the triggers are analog buttons. So as I start to press it down, you can see where pressed and touch are changing and value is increasing as I press it down further and further. If I press it down all the way, there's one. If I start to release it, you can see it dropping down. So it works that way for the left trigger and the right trigger. Uh, the paddles that are on the top are just digital buttons, so it's just ones and zeros there. And then we have a few other buttons uh, that we can press. Let's see, X, B, X, Y, and then I've already, I think I've done the shoulder buttons, but here are the shoulder buttons. So they're right next to each other. Uh, then we have the other mini buttons that are on the controller. And I've already gone through the ones that are associated with, uh, the, with the directional sticks. 
So it looks like on this controller, almost all, I can get almost all of the buttons that are reported to come on. There's only one that hasn't come on. That's the very last one. And no, pressing the X button on here will not cause uh, that to be detected. Instead, it ends up bringing the Xbox UI that's on Windows, which I don't want to open, so I'll close that back. But overall, I think you get a much more consistent experience on the Xbox controller than I did on the 8-bit though controller. Now, if you want to try this out yourself, uh, you don't have to download the code and get it set up on a machine to run. I did also put this on a public URL so that you can see it. And if you want to try it out, you can just go to this URL and you'll see this exact same source code that I have running here. Well, almost the exact same. The one exception is there's also a link within there that you can use for just downloading the full source code. Uh, so go ahead and try it out.